The squat is often nicknamed the king of all exercises, and this is because there are few other exercises that compare to the squat as far as intensity and the sheer number of muscles that are required to perform this movement, which means you could definitely make the argument that almost everyone should include some form of squatting as part of their exercise routine. So today, we're gonna dive deep into the anatomy of squatting by using the cadavers to show you the majority of the surprising muscles involved with squats how those muscles have to contract differently when lowering down versus rising back up, and even discuss how breathing properly can protect your spine and also make you a better squatter. We've definitely got some anatomical awesomeness to cover, so let's do this. So when we're talking about the squat, we'll focus mainly on three joints of the lower limb as well as talk about stabilizing the spine. But when I go down to say like a barbell squat position, if I lower down, we'd look at my ankle, my ankle would be in what's called dorsal flexion. And if you haven't heard of dorsal flexion before, when your foot's off the ground, dorsal flexion is when the top of the foot comes towards the sky, like when you're pulling your foot off the gas pedal. But in a squat position, because the foot's planted, that movement comes because the tibia slides over the foot. Now, when I come back down again to that lowered position, dorsal flexion of the ankle, my knee is flexed, and then my hip is flexed. But when I stand up, my ankle goes into a little bit of plantar flexion, the knee extends, and the hip extends. Now, the reason I went over those joint movements is because there are multiple muscles, or specific muscles, I should say, that are going to be involved in mobilizing or moving each one of those joints. So let's start with the muscles that mobilize the ankle. Now, admittedly, most people don't think about working their calves when squatting, but these muscles are technically active during a squat. So let's quickly cover some of the main ones. Here you can see the most superficial muscle of the posterior calf called the gastrocnemius, as well as part of the soleus, with which most of it lies deep to the gastrocnemius. So on this side, we've removed the superior bellies or the superior portion of the gastroc, so you can see the upper portion of that soleus. Kind of looks like a soulfish here. Now, how are these muscles active during a squat? Now, I often like to show students the length changes that occur with a muscle kind of using a rubber band throughout various movements or certain exercise movements. And so let's use this rubber band as we go down into a squat position. Now remember, we already talked about the ankle going into dorsal flexion when I lower down and then plantar flexion when I come up. And so the gastroc and soleus, how they would be active, as I go down into the squat, especially the soleus because my knee gets bent, we're gonna see that these muscles will eccentrically contract or lengthen as I'm stretching the rubber band there. And as we stand up into plantar flexion, those muscles will concentrically contract or get shorter. Now, I'll get into more detail about concentric, eccentric, and isometric contractions when we talk about the thigh. But what's crazy about this is that we could technically get into even more muscles that are active during a squat, especially like the intrinsic foot muscles. Like if you were to even squat barefoot, those foot muscles would become even more active. Now, there are 12 intrinsic foot muscles on the bottom of the foot or the sole of the foot. So we're gonna actually save the foot muscles for a foot dedicated video. But again, most of the muscles that we're talking about down in the calf and the foot aren't going to be the main focus of the squat because most people think about those thigh muscles being engaged during a squat, especially these anterior thigh muscles that we call the quads, technically the quadriceps. Quad means four, seps means head. So we're gonna actually see the quads are made up of four individual muscles. We have the vastus lateralis out here on the side. We have the vastus medialis on the inside, and then the rectus femoris here. And the fourth quad muscle that we'll see is if I slide that rectus femoris out of the way, you can see underneath there, there's another muscle, and I'll touch it with the tip of the probe, and this is called the vastus intermedius. Now the quads are primarily going to be involved in mobilizing the knee during a squat. So let's orient this rubber band as if it's one of the quad muscles. And as I lower down to that flexed or again lowered position, you can see the rubber band actually lengthens. This would be considered an eccentric contraction of the quads. Eccentric contractions are when the muscles are actively lengthening. Think of it as like controlling the movement, controlling ourselves down. And as an FYI, our muscles tend to really respond well to eccentric loading from a strength and hypertrophy perspective. But let's say I decided to hold the bottom of the squat, which I'm doing now and feeling a little bit of the burn. This would be considered an isometric contraction. The muscles active, but not changing its length. But when we need to stand up and extend the knee with the quads, the quads will shorten, and we call that a concentric contraction. But let's go back to some of the thigh muscles, specifically the muscles on the posterior thigh, and we can take a look at these on the cadaver by magically flipping the cadaver over. 
So here you can see we've turned the body over. We're looking at a posterior view of the thigh and we've got the hamstrings on both sides here. And let me actually hook the hamstrings with the probe here. And you can see we've got three muscles that actually make up each hamstring. We've got the biceps femoris, the semitendinosus, and look at why it got called the semitendinosus. You can see this long cylindrical tendon. This is an FYI, the semitendinosus tendon can be used as an ACL graft. And then we have the semimembranosus, and you can see why it got its name membranosus because of this membrane wide broad tendon here. Now the hamstrings do mobilize the knee with certain movements, but in the case of the squat, they're primarily going to be working at the hip. Now, I apologize that you're gonna to have to deal with the back side of my body here for a second, but let's put the rubber band in the orientation of one of the hamstrings. And as we come down into hip flexion, the hamstrings will eccentrically contract on the way down, but then concentrically contract, shortening and bringing us up into hip extension. The gluteus maximus does something similar, but let me show you the gluteus maximus. You can see it here on the left side, as well as here on the right, one of the largest muscles in the human body. So in the case of the squat, if I make my makeshift rubber band gluteus maximus, similar to the hamstrings, as we come down into hip flexion, the gluteus maximus will eccentrically contract, and then when we come back up, it'll shorten or concentrically contract to bring us up into hip extension. And so that takes care of the main muscles involved in the squat at the knee and the hip, but we also need to protect our spine when we're squatting, especially if we're loading up with a barbell. We don't wanna be twisting or folding forward at the lumbar spine or anywhere at the spine for that matter. And so we need some core stabilizers and some extensor muscles for the spine. Some core stabilizers like the external oblique is active as well as the internal oblique and another muscle called the transversus abdominis which helps us to kind of create this natural weight belt in our abdomen to really stabilize our lumbo pelvic region and protect that spine. Now I did mention some spinal extensors. Spinal extensors would do a movement. So let me show you what flexion looks like. Flexion of the spine looks like this. I'm trying not to get my hips involved because that would be something else, but your spinal extensors will contract and pull you upright and keep your spine erect in this position that we want our spine to maintain as we go down with a squat, especially if we're loading with a barbell or some other form of weight. But let me show you these spinal extensors on this cadaver dissection. So to orient you to this particular cadaver dissection, you're looking at a posterior view or the back side of the body, and we've removed some pretty familiar muscles on this right side, like the latissimus dorsi or the lats have been removed, the trapezius, often nicknamed the traps, has been removed, and obviously you can see the right upper limb's been removed to expose these long strap-like muscles that are part of this erector spiny group and they're the true back muscles. And what I mean by the true back muscles is they actually mobilize the spine with that spinal extension that I showed just a second ago. But there again are three muscles in this erector spiny group. We have the iliocostalis between my probe, then we have the longissimus, and then we have the spinalis right along the spine here. Now I'll often give my students little mnemonics to help them remember the names of certain muscles, like these because one starts with I, another starts with L, another one starts with S. We would often say, I love school or I love soccer. But the mnemonic that seemed to stick the most with students for some reason was I love sex. And I guess that makes a little bit more sense because they are part of the erector spiny group after all. But what's remarkable about all of this is all the muscles that are involved in creating this amazing compound exercise movement that we call the squat. And so we might as well add two other muscles to this list because these muscles are going to be extremely important for protecting us. And we don't think about these muscles really when we squat, but they are very important. And one's technically a muscle group. And that muscle group is the pelvic floor. The pelvic floor muscles form this bowl within your pelvis and they help to support your pelvic organs. And they also contain some sphincters like a urethral sphincter so you can control when you pee and choose to, when you choose to pee when you wanna pee and they also are engaged when you contract your abdominal muscles. So think about contracting the obliques and the transversus that we talked about earlier, and that will also shore up that pelvic floor. But let's pause on the pelvic floor muscles for just a second because they are gonna work in conjunction with the next muscle, the diaphragm. So you can see the diaphragm here, it's this dome-shaped muscle, and we typically think of the diaphragm as the breathing muscle because it is the breathing muscle. And so when the diaphragm contracts, it pulls down in this direction, and that will increase the volume of the thoracic cavity. And so if we have more space up here, that allows air to rush in and fill the lungs with more air because now they have more available space to fill when the diaphragm pulls down in this direction. 
but what happens when the diaphragm pulls down in this direction, let me show you on this angle, let's say this hand is the pelvic floor and this is shored up because we're contracting it with the abdominal muscles and the diaphragm contracts and pushes downward, that's going to increase the pressure in that abdominal cavity. You can see kind of how that would work by pushing downward. We're going to increase the pressure here. And we actually want to increase the pressure within the abdominal cavity while we squat. Think of, as, think of it as if we increase the pressure in here, the abdominal muscles are going to have more to reinforce themselves on or to kind of push against, if you will. And so that will help us to shore up even more our lumbopelvic region and to stabilize and protect our spine. Now, one thing that I want to talk about is how to breathe. Now, you don't want to get a bar on your back when you're squatting and do some weird breathing where you're like opening up your ribs and shrugging your shoulders up or anything like that. You want to think of almost like breathing downward into your belly. And so how you could test to do this is if you put your fingers on your obliques and you breathe properly, like a lot of people will do it in through their nose, you want to kind of feel your abdominal muscles wanting to push out. But when you squat, think of these two words, breathe and brace. So if you're at the top of the squat, you're going to breathe and brace. And think of it almost like bracing like if somebody's going to punch you in the stomach. Because if you knew somebody was going to punch you in the stomach, you'd, and you'd brace that. And that's kind of what you want to do with the squat here. So if I get the barbell on my back here, again, we're going to think breathe and brace. So breathe in and hold, go down. Now the exhale is, you can start to exhale when you get close to the top of the squat or you can wait till you get to the very top, but you don't want to breathe out all your air when you're at the bottom and most vulnerable because then you're going to lose that connection in your lumbopelvic region and not be able to stabilize your spine. So it's pretty incredible to think that breathing properly, one, will help you to protect your lumbopelvic region, and two, you'll likely be able to be a more effective squatter and potentially even squat more weight, obviously, safely. Now again, the pelvic floor and the diaphragm are muscles that you could kind of think of as protecting you and making you a more effective squatter. But again, we typically think of the thigh muscles and the glutes as the muscles that we're really working with the squat. And there is one last muscle I do want to talk about with squatting. And it's a muscle people don't typically think about. And this muscle will also be important for our next video called Built the Squat. Because we're also going to do a video on why some people might be a little bit better built for squatting than others. But let's talk about this last muscle. Have you ever done a squat workout and afterwards you've noticed like the inside of your thighs are sore? Well, you can thank a muscle called the adductor magnus for that soreness. Adductor because this muscle will be involved in adduction of the hip, which is bringing the hip in towards the midline, and magnus because it's a huge muscle. Now, this adductor magnus does more than just getting involved in adducting the hips. It does something very important for squatting. And let me show you this muscle on this cadaver dissection. So I actually need to glove up for this one because I need to move the hamstrings out of the way. But you can see this big muscle called the adductor magnus here on the left, and you can even see it over here on the right. Now there's two heads to this muscle. One of the heads, the fibers are more oblique or in a diagonal orientation, going in this way towards the femur on both sides. If I showed you on me, it'd be going in like so on my left and going in like this on my right. But the other head that you can see specifically right here is called the condylar head. And this head's very important. And as an FYI, it's called the condylar head because it attaches to this bump called the adductor tubercle on the medial condyle of the femur, hence called the condylar head. But this condylar head, the fibers are not oriented in that oblique direction. They're going more vertically, mimicking the fiber orientation of the hamstrings. And so this condylar head is very important to mobilizing the hip of the squat as well. And so when we talk about the adductor magnus, it's very similar to what the hamstrings would do. Again, I apologize for the backside view again, but if we were to do this, the adductor magnus will also eccentrically contract when we go into hip flexion and then concentrically contract to help bring us up. And it gets even more active or more work the deeper you go in a squat. And this muscle can get a little bit involved in limiting some of your movements depending on your body type. But we're going to wait and talk more about how your body type and certain muscles like the adductor magnus can affect how you squat in our next squat video, which will also cover why some people could be a little bit better built for squatting than others. But more importantly, what you can do to make yourself a better squatter regardless of your body type. So stay tuned for that next video. 
but hopefully today's video helped to give you a strong anatomical foundation on squatting and why squatting can be such a bang for buck exercise just based on all the joints and muscles required to perform this exercise movement. So thanks for watching and supporting the channel. If you are watching this video a week or two after we released it, I'll link the next squat video here as well as link a video on back pain to help motivate you to protect your back during squatting. And I'll see you down in the comments and in the next video.